little bit about me. I'm, I'm from the Desert Research Institute in Reno, Nevada. Uh, I started my professional career at the State Engineer's Office in Nevada, where we've had groundwater law for about 90 years. Um, and my main task while I was working there was to figure out consumptive use uh, for the state of Nevada and, and produce this report where we could pick on a groundwater basin and it would say what the consumptive use of that basin was. So this kind of has been uh, in the process ever since and, and I'd like to really acknowledge Forrest and his team. Um, basically none of this that I'm gonna show today wouldn't be possible without uh, running all our codes on the NASA Earth Exchange. So field scale ET is important for understanding agricultural consumptive use. We really need historical ET maps to manage surface and groundwater resources. So support predictive studies of surface and groundwater consumptive use. Basically the bottom line is knowing the past will help us better predict the future. If we don't know how much we've been consuming, which we really don't, I would argue, how can we figure out how much we're gonna consume if we change something or under changing climate, et cetera. So remote sensing is really the only way to estimate actual consumptive use over large areas and long time histories. And, and really another bottom line here is you can't manage what you don't measure. And I would argue that we haven't been measuring much um, when it comes down to figuring out pumping records, good luck but we can estimate pumping from knowing what the consumptive use is, especially in areas where we know where, uh, for, for example, soil groundwater areas or surface water areas or commingled areas, that's more difficult, but if we know the diversions from the surface water sources, uh, then we can start to tease out the groundwater part. So the goal, develop timely maps of monthly and annual ET for any area and time period of interest. Um, we're gonna focus on the Central Valley for now, 85 to present. Use the whole Landsat archive. Why Landsat? Field scale, like Forrest mentioned. Um, why energy balance, like Forrest mentioned, to account for stress and evaporation not directly considered by optical methods. So uh, just to give you kind of a sense of, of what we're dealing with here, um, uh, we need to use gridded weather data. We need to use precipitation uh, and, and evaporative demand specifically. We're gonna use the metric energy balance model. We need an automated approach uh, and we need lots of horsepower. So uh, that is computer horsepower. So we have about 22 images per year per uh, little uh, white square, which is a Landsat scene, 30 years of data. That's 6,000 images to process. We really, we really need supercomputing and, and cloud computing to do this. So uh, just some mechanics here. Um, Landsat uh, snapshots, they're just that, they're snapshots. We need integrated measures of ET, like monthly and annual totals, and that becomes more complicated. Um, so here's an example. Of, of an ET map in the upper right, and you can see that, that, that field variability, that within field variability that's so important that Forrest was talking about detecting stress. Um, we can really see it with surface temperature. Um, surface temperature is really useful because uh, of the evaporative cooling effect. Uh, the more evaporation you have, uh, you're consuming more energy, and so therefore it's cooler. Um, so we can really exploit that. Um, so what we do basically uh, in terms of mechanics, we have a time series of, of evaporative demand or called reference ET that's usually from a weather station, function of solar radiation, temperature, humidity, wind speed. This is either gridded or station-based. And then we take snapshots of the fraction of reference ET uh, every eight to 16 days. And that's shown in those uh, green triangles in the middle chart. And then we uh, interpolate temporally interpolate to daily time steps per pixel. So we create a stack of daily ETRF images for the year. Um, and then we multiply the time series of reference ET by the fraction of reference to get the ET. And that's shown on the right. So a lot of computations, we're creating daily stacks of images for the whole Central Valley for 30 years. So we developed an automated approach. Um, back in 2013, and we originally developed it uh, for Western Nevada and Eastern California, irrigated alfalfa and pasture grass as a test case. And this, this automated approach for metric basically 
automatically selects the hot and cold pixel anchor points uh, to run the energy balance model. And, and basically what we wanted to do was uh, apply and, and validate this approach for the Central Valley um, and, and try to get decent accuracy, 10 to 20 percent. Um, it's complicated um, because of all the different crop types that we're dealing with, but I'll show you a validation that we have uh, produced for Nevada, Eastern California. These are a bunch of eddy flux and bone ratio towers, ET towers. And at the daily time step, you know, it's pretty scattered. Uh, and that's to be expected since the error in the measurements are pretty high themselves, plus or minus 20% for any kind of daily ET measurement from an eddy covariance or bone ratio system. But when you start to aggregate that down to the seasonal scale, um, the scatter collapses. Those whiskers represent the plus or minus 12% uncertainty estimated from the USGS. Um, and the whiskers on the, on the Y are uh, uh, uncertainty based on a bunch of different model runs of metrics. So we, we can run the model hundreds of times on the NASA Earth Exchange and vary some major uh, uncertain parameters like the hot and cold pixel selection. Um, so that's really nice because no ET model or, or method is perfect. Um, there's always uncertainty. So um, using the NASA Earth Exchange has really made this possible. So uh, the assets that we've been accessing are, the, of course, the Landsat Archive, FMask, which is a, a cloud uh, mask algorithm. We do all the atmospheric corrections. We are using NLDAS, the uh, North American Land Data Assimilation System for vapor pressure uh, integrated into our atmospheric corrections and also calculation of evaporative demand. We have spatial CIMIS on there. The Sergo Soils Database to maintain a daily soil water balance model to account for precipitation events in between our Landsat snapshots. So if we have a rain event in between, like right before our snapshot, then we're going to be wet. Or if we have a precipitation event after a snapshot that was dry, we need to account for that, that evaporation that happens after, after that rain event. Um, so we have to maintain a daily soil water balance model to do our time integration properly. A lot of folks don't do that um, because it's hard, um, but, but we're trying to make this whole workflow better. Um, also, we need crop boundaries, so those are, those are uh, on the NEX to limit our calibration pixels. Um, so we can now run metric for entire states and years with Monte Carlo type uncertainty analysis, which is really great. Uh, to basically have average and standard deviation maps that go uh, together. So I'll just show you some results that we applied uh, or that, that uh, I'm going to uh, uh, go over uh, from application of metric for the last five years. Um, and basically what you can see here in 2011, uh, let's see the colors aren't too great, um, but basically the darker greens and blues mean higher ET. So in 2011, don't see too many dark greens and blues. Uh, 2012, 13, 14, you really start to see, especially 2013, you see some, uh, some dark blues. Let's see here, I don't wanna turn this off. There we go. Uh, right up in here and then down in here. Of course, there's a lot of rice being grown up here and a lot of nuts down here. Um, and then in 2015, you kind of see that go away. Um, but the blues down south remain. Um, so there's kind of a story there that I'm going to go through. Basically, in lower ET during the drought in water-limited areas and higher ET during drought in the well-watered areas. So, you know, where you have water uh, in a drought, you're going you're gonna to pump more water into the atmosphere because you have higher evaporative demand. It's called the complementary relationship where we have lower regional ET because we have lower precip. You have higher evaporative demand because of lower humidity higher solar radiation, higher temperatures, um, and, and the opposite is true. Usually when you have wetter conditions annually, regionally, you have higher actual ET regionally, which then reduces the atmospheric demand, and that's what we see in 2011. So, so yeah, here's the spatial CIMIS reference ET layer. So this is evaporative demand. You can see that in 2011 it was fairly low, and then we really ramped up in 13. Um, and that's why we, we see that. So it's, it's kind of multi-part. It's water availability and also evaporative demand. 
So here is a nice way to look at this. This is the ratio of ET to reference ET. So this is the fraction of reference ET, uh, known as the crop coefficient. And you can see that it's fairly stable, right? Um, especially up to the north and down to the south, where I was pointing, pointing out the changes that we see. And then in 2015, we see some drying, finally, especially up to the north. So this is really important to produce, is um, an annual per pixel Landsat scene count. So, so how many scenes, how many snapshots did you actually use to make a seasonal total? Sometimes, like in Wyoming and northern Colorado, um, you only have three cloud-free images to make an annual total. That's three points on your crop coefficient curve. You know, we, we want to have one a month, at least. So you can see that in 2012, this is when we lost Landsat 5, and so we only had Landsat 7. These stripes here that you see, those are the path, uh, or the, yeah, the path overlaps between Landsat 7 and 5, so we get, we get double the counts, basically. Um, so this is really important in terms of assessing accuracy and, and providing some confidence to our ET numbers. So how, many, how many counts did you use? How many data points did you have to make your crop coefficient curve? And so I, I argue that we need to make a map like this for every map of ET that we make. So from pretty pictures to accuracy, you know, regional field scale ET maps are really nice for evaluating patterns and trends, but we really need that field scale accuracy to talk about water rights transfers and lawsuits um, and, and figuring out groundwater pumping. Uh, so we're working with NASA uh, forest and collaborators NASA ARC and, and Cal State Monterey Bay um, to, to, to look at these measurements that Forrest presented and, and start to validate our approach. Um, there are a lot of limitations in terms of the approach that we have right now. Um, the automated calibration is, is uh, really complex for California. We aren't accounting for precip precipitation and subsequent evaporation like I described in between snapshots. Um, but that's, we have that workflow developed. We just got to stitch it all together now, uh, not properly accounting for uh, the fraction of reference ET in the wintertime. So in the wintertime, our, our temperature differences between, say, a hot pixel, bare ground, hardly any evaporation happening versus uh, wet ground, that temperature difference is really small in the wintertime. So it's really hard to calibrate an energy balance model with, with very little temperature difference. And so we're going back to a vegetation index type of approach uh, for those periods. Uh, albedo impacts with, with tree crops and, and tall canopies, that's an issue. It makes the surface look dark and makes there be more net radiation being simulated, which will inflate ET. So there's some adjustments that are recommended for that that we're implementing. Also, we have some aerodynamic roughness functions for tree, trees and orchards. Um, we aren't cloud gap filling other than using temporal linear interpolation between the cloud-free scenes. So if we have a, a gap, we just straight line it right through from the scene before and after. There are more elegant ways to deal with that. Um, like I said, we're, we're, we have pieces and parts of all this coded up and implementing it. Here's just an example of the cloud masking challenge that we face. So operational, we hear that a lot. Well, that's pretty hard uh, because we have things like this, where this is the F mask polygon identifying clouds and shadows. But you see a lot of clouds are slipping through. A lot of clouds and shadows are slipping through. So, so what does that do to surface temperature? That cools the surface temperature because we're seeing the cloud top, which makes ET shoot through the roof. Um, a lot of people just put a cap on it. Uh, for those pixels, we actually want to try to do something else. And, and, and a lot of times, we, we just go draw polygons. So we, we've been drawing polygons a lot. Um, and, and over a year, uh, this is kind of what you get. This is from that Landsat scene pixel count map I showed you, just a close-up. And you can see that there are areas in here that are always cloudy, but they aren't always cloudy. Those are cities. Those are some water bodies that are being misclassified due to uh, some specular reflectance. There's, there's other stuff going on here um, where we always have low pixel counts because of the automated cloud mask. So future directions for operational and automated ET. We're adding important workflows. Uh, Monte Carlo analysis so we can make a mean map and a standard deviation map. Uh, finding better ways to manually QAQC. Uh, still takes a pair of eyeballs to QAQC all results. Just no getting around that. 
Uh, it just takes a pair of eyeballs. Um, and then averaging and summarizing all results by field polygons. This is really important. Um, you know, raster maps are really useful, but field polygon maps with monthly ET attributes are much more useful, especially for QAQC. And then operational production of field level summaries. So here's just an example of, of a, a irrigated area in Nevada that is all surface water, no groundwater pumping, it's too salty, and you can see how the drought affects the seasonal ET uh, throughout the, the wet and dry years, where this basin, which is Nevada, Eastern California, supplemental groundwater pumping. When there's a drought, they just keep cruising, right? They're, because they're pumping groundwater. And so we can start to see how policy, water policy, you know, kind of paints a different picture for, for agriculture and consumptive use depending on where you are. So it's really neat to be able to make these summary maps automated in Python and just crank out hundreds of them and cycle through them. Likewise, here's just a, another illustration of that, making histograms of ET in feet per year, acreage, um, and in a wet year, you can see that we're, we're bumping up what the potential crop ET is, which is like a Pem and Monteith crop coefficient type of approach, like Simita, um, Cal Simita, where you know, there's a lot of fields that are below that because they aren't optimal, they aren't perfect. So you know, in a dry year, we go way to the left and down, and in a wet year, we're bumping right up to that potential, but not all fields are the same or at near the potential. So future directions, um, we're using cloud and supercomputing to create and store and post-process and disseminate the data. Uh, the data sets can be accessed through a cloud uh, service via a web application like climateengine.org um, that we've developed, and I'll just cycle through a couple slides really quickly to show that. But the bottom line is, is that we would like to create all these data sets on NEX or a Google Cloud Platform, uh, pre-compute and store, and then access Google Earth Engine, which is the parallelized uh, cloud computing platform, and then talk to a front-end web application for the on-demand stat calculations and summaries. So we first started to, uh, this is kind of our first cut at loading these maps for the Central Valley into Google Earth Engine, where we can pick a point and get the reference ET and then get the crop ET. And, and you can see the difference, and here we have some harvests and, and crop rotations that we can clearly see. And then finally, pushing out these maps to a web application to where the public can, can uh, pick their, their different products, uh, types of stats, and then date ranges to aggregate however you want. And then be able to draw a polygon and do spatial averaging in time. So here, this is an alfalfa field in the Central Valley where we've gotten about seven cuttings that year. So a really neat application. I encourage you to go check it out. This is in DVI. Pretty soon we'll have ET on here. So anyways, in summary, I'll catch my breath here. Uh, uh, we've developed and implemented an automated workflow for metric to be run on NEX. It allows for timely field scale historical ET estimates over large areas. We're adding additional workflow, and I think that this will be really useful for Sigma water research reporting, ecological stress and drought impact assessment, et cetera. Um, we really need more measurements. Benchmark data sets are key. Uh, cloud and, and supercomputing is really necessary for this type of work. Um, where to next? Well, basically we want quick and accurate field scale ET analysis with a simple web connection. And so I think uh, that's it. And artificial recharge reception, right? Next. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. We'll take a couple of quick questions before the reception. How does um, evaporation at the ground level um, affect them? Because some crops now are buried drip, and then you have cover crops and orchards. And does that affect your models or what your expectations are? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I, it seems like um, it's a common one in terms of drip versus flood versus sprinkler. Um, we we certainly see reduced bare soil evaporation with drip. Uh, like dirt drip, too. I mean, like turn off alfalfa now or yep. tomatoes or dirt Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, that's right. Yeah, it's it's reduced consumptive use, but. 
it's it's kind of it's kind of a trade-off. I mean, a lot of times you'll get higher yield, and so yield and consumptive use are related. So, you know, being more efficient and increasing your yield a lot of times increases your ET. Um, so I hope my question doesn't make you too con uncomfortable, but um, so there are multiple ET estimation methods, well, including uh, energy balance and some other remote sensing oriented um, methods. S so how do you, what do you think of the future of those multiple methods? Will it converge to one model or maybe, you know, multiple models keep staying and how, how what, what do you think about it? Yeah, I, I don't, honestly, I don't think the science is going to advance a lot further in terms of the physics of these, these models, like the energy balance model, like C-ball and metric, uh, SEBS, they're, they're really, you know, we, we have all the physics that, that, we, that we know about in those, and, and they're, they're pretty well established. Um, the optical-based methods, NDVI and, and others, they're really nice because they don't have these challenges that we have with energy balance where we're trying to use surface temperature with energy balance and, and using surface temperature can be really finicky. Um, cirrus clouds really mess us up, whereas cirrus clouds really, you know, we can get around the cirrus clouds with the NDVI type of approach. Um, cold air pooling uh, really messes us up with surface energy balance, whereas it doesn't with the NDVI. So that's where Forrest and I would like to go is, is you know, try to bring some of these strengths together um, to, to just get, get something going, get a workflow going where we can, we can swap in, in and out, energy balance and optical approaches um, with one workflow. And all it is really is an ETRF or a crop coefficient function. And, and everything else about ET mapping is the hard stuff. The model isn't so hard. It's, it's the time integration. <laughs> it's, it's the cloud screening and, and gap filling and and it, it's the entire workflow, not so much the model. So that, that piece, I think we have a long ways to go in terms of the workflow. Great. Thank you very much, Justin.